55, everyone. I'm Stefan Tillman, I'm the Executive Director of the Sydney Manhattan Research Institute, or SIMRI, as we call it for short. So we bring international researchers to Australia to collaborate with mathematical scientists all across Australia. But we also try to bring the community together. So high school students, I see quite a few uniforms here in the room, and people who do long enough to still be uh, students. Uh, parents, of course, educators, researchers, and we try to do with events like this one here. Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge the medical people of the Aurora Nation who have been conducting scientific inquiry on this continent and its communication for over 65,000 years. So tonight, in terms of mathematical communication, so it's my pleasure to introduce Milena Lakovic. She's an associate professor in mathematics here at the University of Sydney. She grew up in Belgrade, and she attended a school that's called the Mathematical Grammar School. <laughs> that's an amazing name, isn't it? And so it's a school for basically gifted and talented students in mathematics, physics, and informatics. And half of the staff at the school are actually academics at the University of Belgrade. So, I mean, to me, it sounds a bit like, yeah, how about school of witchcraft, but somehow with better spells and better coaching class. Yeah. Anyway, um, but that's just my take on it. So, um, so Milena was actually a member of the International Mathematics Olympiad team of Yugoslavia. And in 1989, she won the bronze medal. If I recall correctly, yeah, that's great. And she trained to be a high school teacher, and she also taught at the Mathematical Grammar School for two years, and then received her PhD in 2003 from the University of Belgrade. And she remained honorary with the uh, Grammar School in Belgrade for 20 years ago. And she also held the three year position at the Weizmann Institute. In Israel, and she had a six year affiliation with a Research Institute for Physics and um, Mathematics in Fiesta in Italy. And so, Melinda came to Australia in 2013, what was meant to be, so again, a temporary stay. Uh, but we're very delighted that she chose to stay here permanently in um, 2016. And so she remains, of course, engaged in her research and teaching, but she's also committed to engaging with talented high school students, and that's what she still does here. And so it's my pleasure that Melina will tonight take us on her take of geometry. Okay, please welcome Melina. Thank you, Stefan, for this uh, nice uh, introduction. Uh, so, my talk today will be about uh, geometry. As you see, at, uh, here, I chose here several uh, art pieces from different places in the world and from different points in the time. I would like in this talk to, to show how there is a strong geometric thread connecting those art pieces. And uh, on the way to that, uh, to see uh, something of the story of geometry. Okay, let's start with this ancient picture on, uh, from Egypt, very ancient, 14th century before our year. And uh, in this picture, we have uh, presented what is called the rope stretching, uh, which is uh, an uh, ancient way of uh, measurement. Before I explain how it was used, uh, just let me uh, remind you that uh, geometry is uh, the word of uh, Greek origin, and it means uh, originally its meaning is uh, is uh, land measurement, measuring land. So geometry in ancient time was a uh, uh, kind of set of tools and tricks which, which uh, were facilitated, which facilitated the uh, easier uh, land uh, measurement. So this is the, the origin of uh, of geometry. So here we see in the, in the image, uh, people stretching a rope. And you will notice on the rope on the equal distances, uh, there are knots. And uh, now with such a rope, with knots on equal distances, we are able to, to measure distances. We, are, uh, we were able, and also, uh, I mean, in ancient Egypt, they, they knew that trick, that you can do other things with such ropes. So, as you have below this image, 
uh, a rope with um, with 13 equal pieces, which are uh, divided by, by lots. It can be uh, stretched in the following way. So we connect the, the end point of the rope. And now we, we, we stretch it so that we get a triangle with sides uh, equal uh, uh, to two, three, four, and five pieces. And uh, uh, so it was known since ancient times that, that when we do that, that we will get a round angle in uh, between the sides of planets uh, three and four. And that uh, was used, for example, in building to make a perfect uh, right uh, angle. So this uh, three, four, and five is, a, as we know, Pythagorean triple. And we, we, that was known. Um, so, and that was used since, since ancient time. We will return later uh, to the Pythagorean, Pythagoras theorem. So, let's go back. Uh, so, we are still in Egypt, but a bit later. I will tell you about uh, Thales of Miletus, who was a Greek uh, uh, mathematician and philosopher, um, on uh, his, uh, one of his travels in Egypt. Uh, nobody was able to answer him uh, about the height of the pyramid of Cheops. So he uh, invented the following uh, trick to, to measure that height. So on a, on a sunny day, it is possible to measure the length of the, of the shape of the pyramid. And on the other hand, uh, we can uh, have one stick and measure the length of the shape of that stick and also the height of the stick. Since uh, those, uh, uh, now we would have two triangles there, two right triangles with vertical sides corresponding to the heights of, uh, of the pyramid in the sticks. The vertical, the horizontal sides correspond to their shapes. And the hypotenuses of those triangles correspond to those direction of uh, sunlight at that particular part of the day when we took, uh, the, when the measurements are taken. So those triangles are similar, they have all the same angles. So their corresponding uh, sides will be proportional. Uh, so according to this uh, equality, uh, we have we can calculate the pyramid height because all the other the, the, the other three quant quantities are known. This geometric theorem, which says to us that in uh, similar triangles we have proportional sides, is in fact called the theorem of Thales. But now let us ask the following question. How, how to measure in, in to, to apply the previous trick? We needed to, to be able to approach that pyramid in order to be able to measure its uh, shape. So let's say we want to measure the type of something like of this tree, but we cannot approach it. So it is, for example, on the other side of the river. So what do we do there to how do we measure its height? And this is the way to do that. We need to, this is one of the ways to do it. One can imagine a lot of a lot of different ways to do that. But one of the ways would be, for example, the following. So we see here in the first image, we, we would observe the tree from two different points on our side of the river. So from two points where, where we can uh, approach and reach everything. We know distance from, from those two, between those two points A and B, and we can measure the angles uh, which are between the directions, the direction of that uh, uh, AB uh, line, and between the directions which connect uh, points A and B with the uh, with the place where the tree is placed. So based on that, in that triangle with vertices A and B and, uh, and the third vertex is uh, uh, where three is, we know one side the two angles. So we can then calculate everything uh, using elementary trigonometry. We can calculate everything from that triangle. In particular, for example, we can calculate the distance from point A to the three. And now when we know that, we can observe from point uh, A for example, from the from the ground, the angle uh, between the ground uh, direction and the direction uh, when we look towards the top of the thing. And uh, again, now in that, uh, the second one, the the right triangle. Now knowing one side and the angle, elementary uh, trigonometry will give us the height of the thing. 
Now, the next one would be what to do about the objects that are really really far away, like uh, celestial objects. So, this kind of script will not really do there because uh, not only that we cannot approach them, but we, those uh, distances which we can make for measurement are, are very small compared to distances to them. So, in fact, um, those, those measures, such, such a method will not be effective. We, we cannot do that in this way. What can we do then? And now I will show you how that was done in the ancient world. So first I would like to, to recall what uh, Aristotle, uh, what were his conclusions about the universe, about what is surrounding uh, our Earth. So first he concluded that Earth is round because uh, the shape of the Earth during uh, the lunar eclipse is round. His second conclusion was that Earth is not too big. Uh, and this is because uh, uh, the visibility of stars of star is significantly changed on different locations. So you travel somewhere north and south, and then there are some stars which are visible from some points, and some others uh, are never appear, are never seen anymore. So, so it cannot be some, some too large sphere. And the third uh, conclusion was that uh, the Earth was not moving. Uh, and uh, a justification for that was that uh, first the Earth is the center of gravity, which we all feel here, and the second that the stars have the same neutral position looking from any point. So let us illustrate uh, here by on the next uh, slide. So uh, we see here photos of Southern Cross on a sky from two different locations on the Earth. On the left side uh, picture, it's, uh, this is made in Indonesia. So you see on the, on the left part of the sky, there are four bright stars. Uh, stars are from the south and the coast. And on the other, on the right hand photo is uh, again south and the cross in the circle. Circle the, uh, from Hawaii. Hawaii are on the northern hemisphere but not uh, too much far from the north from the equator. So uh, Southern Cross can be also seen uh, from, from the north and hemisphere uh, on the Earth, but not, not too far from the equator. And uh, that is why, by the way, this is, um, the Southern Cross is so close to the horizon there. It is never, uh, on the, on the, uh, where it is seen, it is never too high in the sky. Uh, okay, and then we, we see that this is exactly the configuration Oops, the neutral positions of the stars look exactly the same. So, so it looks like the, those stars are somehow on some larger sphere where Earth is in the center, but they are somewhere there arranged uh, on, on that larger sphere. Okay, so next uh, I would like to, to tell about uh, Aristarchus of Samos who lived in the 4th and 3rd uh, century before our era. And uh, he observed the, uh, the positions of, uh, neutral positions of sun, earth, and moon when uh, we have half moon on, on the sky. So on the, when uh, we have half moon, that means that we see on, on our sky the half of the shade and half of the, of the side of the moon, which shoots towards sun. And that will mean, in fact, that the uh, sun, earth, and moon at that moment are uh, form a right triangle, where moon is at the vertex of the right angle. So Aristarchus measured the angle between sun and moon of the sky in that particular moment. And uh, his measurement was that this angle is uh, 87 degrees. So based on that, we can. Uh, Conclude, now he concluded, and we can write now in modern notation, that the, uh, the ratio of distances of the Earth from Moon and the Sun equals cosine of 87 degrees. So this is one, one relationship. So the next uh, relationship, uh, which involves uh, positions of uh, Moon and Sun with respect to Earth, uh, can be uh, derived when we uh, observe the total uh, solar e eclipse. So we know that the, that the disk of the moon is, uh, we see that it is covering uh, the disk of the sun and it will exactly 
exactly cover the sun at the, at the moment of the total solar eclipse. So in the other words, the disks of uh, the sun and the moon looks, uh, look exactly at the, of the same size to us on the Earth. Um, so they appear to be of the same size delta. Delta will be this angle and small angle, and then we, we see this uh, diameter of uh, sun and moon on the sky. And now, based on, on that, we have that this uh, we call the small d is the distance to the moon, the large d is the distance to the sun, m is the diameter of moon, x is the diameter of sun. So we will check this proportion, but they are proportional, their distances from the Earth are proportional to their diameters. And this uh, delta, their size of the sky, will be uh, equal exactly to the ratio of the diameter of uh, sun and its distance from the Earth. Okay, so we get two more relations here. And now delta is the thing that can be measured from, from the Earth. So, so this is one thing that we, something that can be observed, uh, can be measured here. And uh, the third relation, which is the fourth relation, because we had two on the previous slide, I start to store, uh, observe the moon during the total lunar eclipse. And what he did, he measured the time that moon is spent in the Earth's shape. So that means uh, he measured time from where moon completely enters to the shape until the moon starts to appear uh, on the other side of the, of the shape. And uh, based on, the, on that time, he concluded that in fact the diameter of, that, uh, of the shape of the Earth at that place uh, where moon is, or the distance of the moon is exactly uh, equal to two uh, diameters of, uh, of the moon. So we have such a geometrical representation here. And uh, based on that, we can, uh, we can uh, conclude the following. So again, uh, this is uh, one application of the theorem of Thales. Uh, so we have, uh, we can have from here a whole uh, bunch of uh, proportions. I will just, I will not derive that, just to, to uh, so we have the, here, the, uh, so this is sun, this is earth, this is moon, this is here. And we have here distance large d, distance small d, and we have here also distance some x, distance from the moon to the this vertex of this shade of the earth. So this uh, is maybe if x is not important to us, but it will uh, uh, figure out in the theorem of Thales. So we will have that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, diameter of sun. Uh, uh, with uh, divided by the, the sum of this d plus d plus x will be equal to the diameter of our earth divided by small d plus x, and this is the same as uh, here we have two x divided by x. And now from this proportion we can divide in fact when we have that uh, quantities are proportional, we 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 will have that. Uh, the sun minus s minus e will be equal to uh, when we when we subtract the one we get d is equal to e minus two n divided by d. This is simple algebra to check that we can uh, we can subtract those uh, those quantities which are proportional and, and again get the proportion. Okay, so this is basically the yeah the upper relation. So what, what uh, do we have? Now let us summarize uh, the, the, those findings of Aristarchus. So we have uh, after the four relationships that he got uh, about the distances of Earth from the moon and the, and the sun and about the diameters of those of the Earth, moon and sun. And um, those relations uh, are, so we have in total uh, four relations for five unknown quantities. So those relations, uh, for example, give us possibility to express all other quantities through the diameter of, uh, of the Earth. Okay, just let me note that there, uh, in these formulas, 
I know uh, the red quantity is 87 degrees, then two, which, which multiplies the, the diameter of moon, and this angle delta are measured quantities. So that are quantities that are sample subject measure. Uh, they were not uh, really accurate, uh, which is not uh, so strange because it is it is hard to get them accurate with the with the very simple tools, handmade tools, and also small uh, small mistakes there can lead to a very large uh, mistake in, in the final uh, results. But uh, nevertheless, uh, his um, conclusions uh, were that the sun is much larger than, than the Earth. That, uh, so based on that, he concluded that the sun is in the center and that the Earth revolves about the sun. He also concluded that uh, the distances between celestial bodies are uh, huge. And then, in fact, he, uh, he concluded that the stationary the existence of stationary stars or, or that the configuration of stars are are, are the same uh, whenever and from wherever the look of them are the same. In fact, it does not imply that the Earth uh, is also stationary, that the Earth does not uh, move. So this is the counter argument to the Aristotle's initial uh, reasoning. Okay, and then let's go further to Eratosthenes is also a, a famous a mathematician and a philosopher, usually known by his algorithm for, for finding prime numbers. But uh, what he did, he calculated the perimeter of the Earth and he did that uh, in a pretty accurate way. How, how did he do that? So he lived in Alexandria. He heard that in the city of, uh, of Siena, which is in the south of Egypt, it is today all last one, that there is a well uh, where at exactly one day in the year you can see the reflection of the sun in the bottom of that well. So that means that uh, if that day will be the day of the summer solstice, and this is the day where at that point the sun is exactly in the, in the zenith. So, on the day of the summer solstice, he, in Alexandria, he measured, so exactly at noon, he put a pole and uh, measured the shadow of the pole. So, based on the length of the pole, or, or the stick and its shadow, it's possible to calculate the angle between the, the shape and, uh, and the stick. Now, applying the, the simple uh, theorem that the alternate interior angles are equal, uh, we can conclude, he concluded, that the angle between Alexandria and Siena uh, from the center of the Earth will be exactly equal to that angle. In fact, this is angle of the sun rays at the moon uh, in, on the day of summer solstice in Alexandria. And this is, uh, this was, one fiftieth of the full circle, according to his measurement, which is about seven degrees. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he also knew that the distance between Alexandria and Siena is uh, about uh, 5,000 stadia. Stadium is an ancient measure for, for distance, and uh, this is about uh, 800 kilometers in our modern uh, measurements. So based on that, one can calculate the perimeter of the Earth is about 14,000 kilometers, which is a pretty accurate uh, estimate. Okay. However, uh, those uh, findings of ancient mathematicians are, are pretty striking, uh, but they, they were not uh, widely spread then as knowledge as they are, for example, today. They, they were pretty forbidden, and I mean, people um, had different theories on what is how the, the universe looks, or that, that the Earth is in the center, or flat, or whatever. And that, in fact, uh, changed in a more massive uh, scale uh, during the, what is called Co Copernican Revolution. So, Copernican Revolution started with uh, Copernicus, so now this is the 15th, 16th century, much closer to our time. And uh, in uh, his uh, book on the revolutions of the celestial uh, spheres, he suggested the heliocentric model where the Earth and the other planets of our solar system are uh, 
revolving about, uh, about sun along circular orbits. The next uh, big step in the Copernican revolution uh, was the work of Johannes uh, Kepler. So the uh, quote of Johannes Kepler, geometry is the archetype of the beauty of the world, is, was uh, inspiration for the title of this lecture today. So uh, Copernicus formulated the laws of uh, planetary motion, which are uh, illustrated in, in this picture here. So now, uh, instead of circles, he uh, postulates uh, ellipses in the orbits uh, of planets. So let, let me just remind you of the ellipse. So when a circle is a set of points in the plane, which are all on the same fixed distance from the given center. An ellipse will be, uh, for an ellipse, we have two points, which are called focal. And uh, now we consider uh, all points whose sum of distances to those two focal is common. So this will be an ellipse. So this is a, an, um, um, how to say generalization of, of circle, uh, I mean, if two foci are coincide with each other, ellipse will, will degenerate to a circle. Uh, ellipses are part of conical, are uh, one type of conical section, and they were studied already in uh, ancient Greece. Okay, so those are his three laws illustrated on the picture to the right. Uh, so, the orbit of the planet is an ellipse where the sun is uh, in one of the focal of that ellipse. Uh, then we have that um, the line segment which connects the position of the planet to the sun will sweep the same areas uh, during the same time period. So, as you can see here, those areas A1 and A2 are shaded. Uh, uh, that say, say that's in fact about the speed of the of the planet along the orbit. And the third one is that um, uh, relates the orbital period of the planet with the with the size of that ellipse. In fact, in particular, with the length of the major axis of the of its elliptical orbit. And uh, finally, Copernican revolution was concluded. Uh, with Isaac Newton, with his uh, principle of natural uh, philosophy, where he formulated uh, his other uh, laws of, of motion and the uh, law of gravitation. Uh, Newton's uh, derivation in his uh, book are very much uh, follow rigor of mathematical deduction and are based uh, on the Greek knowledge on uh, on atomic uh, section and the uh, Greek uh, and the uh, rigor of mathematics, which was uh, started in ancient Greece. Okay, now I would like to say a bit uh, more about uh, Copernican uh, revolution. So Copernican revolution is uh, often not only for that particular revolution of changing the, our view of the universe from the one where Earth is in the center to the uh, other one where, where Earth is revolving about uh, something else. It is uh, used uh, for any uh, paradigm shift uh, uh, nowadays often, or which means for any fundamental change in the concepts of understanding. And uh, the famous philosopher Kant, in his critique of pure reason, uh, made the, the analogy with the Copernican revolution. And he argued that uh, this assumption that knowledge must conform to objects should be changed to the object that must conform to our a priori knowledge. And uh, he also emphasized that the uh, uh, revolution involved uh, in, that uh, the mathematics in Newtonian and physics represent a uh, revolution in Tony. Now, I would like to one example to, to explain uh, Hans' uh, concept of uh, shifting uh, from knowledge which confirms to objects to objects that must confirm to our a priori knowledge. So I would like to tell you about the discovery of Neptune. Uh, Neptune was basically discovered like uh, in the middle of the uh, 19th century. It was uh, maybe a few times observed before that, but it was uh, usually thought to be uh, 
found another star or something like that. So anyway, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, we have Alexis Boulevard made the prediction of future for the position of, uh, of the planet of Uranus based on the Newton's laws of motion and uh, gravitation. And uh, those, in fact, uh, his prediction uh, turned out that those, uh, his calculated positions were substantially deviated for, for what was subsequently observed uh, by Iran. So, based on that, people assume that there is something, uh, I mean, wrong or missing there. And one uh, uh, possible assumption is there is that there is some uh, perturbing body which uh, which affects Uranus and due to which uh, we have those deviations in its position. So now uh, again, based on uh, Newton's laws of motion and gravitation, in uh, 1846, Urbana de calculated the position of the of that perturbing body. And uh, in September the same uh, year, in, uh, in the Berlin Observatory, they, they looked uh, exactly to the place which uh, they calculated, and indeed they, they, they noticed uh, Neptune there, in uh, really one, uh, only within one degree of the calculated position. And now the, the last uh, uh, sentence on this slide uh, is the from the letter of the director of Berlin Observatory to Verrier, and he wrote to him, the planet whose place we have computed really exists. So this is an example where uh, you see that with a good uh, a priori knowledge, uh, we stop to be only observer of, uh, of things around, around us and learning about things only by observing them. We, we are able to to, to predict and to know more uh, about what we really haven't observed. So we, the theory told our a priori knowledge know, told, okay, there is something there. They, they looked to the sky and they really observed it, it there. They, they observed the thing there. This is that concept of uh, objects which confirm to our a priori knowledge. Okay, but now I would like to go back to the origins of the of the deduction in uh, in mathematics, and uh, let's go back again to Pythagoras' theorem, which uh, which was mentioned at the beginning. So Pythagoras' theorem is, as we know, it is uh, credited to Pythagoras, although historically it is not uh, clear that he proved it, and he certainly was not the first to know about that or that one. But um, anyway. Uh, so Pythagoras theorem was known as a geometric fact uh, much uh, earlier than Pythagoras uh, was born. It was known uh, in the ancient civilization for at least uh, 1800 uh, uh, years before our year. Uh, but uh, when we say it's a geometric fact, that means that uh, it was mostly known as something like this, you can't show three, four, five, you get right angles. Uh, usually, uh, without proof, and uh, only maybe for certain examples. Maybe some proofs were also known or something, but uh, yeah, uh, that, that was not part of, of some uh, larger system. Now, here on this image, we have one proof, one simple proof of the Pythagoras here. So, let's see here. We have uh, this uh, blue. Uh, right triangle on the left side, left hand side of the image, we have four such blue uh, congruent right triangles. Uh, so they are arranged in this position, put it together with those two squares, which are constructed over the, the smaller side of that right triangle, and we then will uh, together form a square of the bigger square whose side is A plus B. Now when we arrange uh, the right, the blue right triangles, so that the uh, uh, vertices of right angles will be the vertices of, of the big uh, square. We will have in between this uh, square, which is in fact a square over the hypotenuse of that angle. So based on the comparing uh, that one, uh, the comparing the areas here, we get the in fact exactly the a square plus b square equals c square for. Uh, 
Okay. So we get here, we have to, we apply some reasoning in the deduction in this uh, image. So what, what was uh, in this proof? So what was the fact that we used? So uh, we used the fact that the sum of the angles in the triangle equals the same thing. So I did I didn't mention that, but it is implicitly from this um, image. You want uh, on the right hand side this big red club angle which you get in the middle. Uh, we need, uh, in order to prove that it is a square, we need that uh, to, to have that the, the angle in its vertices are right. And they will be right because the sum of the angles in the, in the, in the, in the triangle is equal to the straight angle. The straight angle is the angle of 180 degrees. So it is straight like that. This is why uh, that thing. So we use uh, uh, some fact. So now if you want to to be really rigorous, we want uh, to prove also that fact. We want to have some rigor, so we want to, to have things uh, well justified and proved. And we don't want to have things which are known like from some kind of experimentation or something. So let's now prove the, the next one. Let's prove the, the sum of the angles in the triangle equals uh, to the straight angle, okay, 180 degrees. So we have here one triangle. So what do we do here? These light blue uh, segments, one is the extension of this horizontal uh, edge of the triangle, and the other one is parallel to the opposite uh, side of the triangle. And now we use the following. We use uh, the two parallel lines are intersected by a third line, then the alternate angles are equivalent to each other, and the corresponding angles equal to each other. So corresponding angles are the green one, the alternate angles are the red one. So we see here that the red, the green, and the yellow one will exactly add up to the straight angle. Okay, but now again, we have some facts which we use to prove that. And that fact again needs its proof. So now I will not present the proof of that fact, but we can see here that in fact, this uh, chain of, of uh, rigorous uh, justification cannot be, in fact, uh, completely executed because we always we, we want to prove something from all the known facts, and uh, but then these uh, facts we want also to prove them from something uh, facts which we know are even real, which are even simpler, and so on. But we need Something if we don't, if we need to, to, to stop somewhere. We need to have uh, some something which really which will be the base of the theory and from we, where everything else will be deduced. So the, the same principle is in fact uh, from, for example, this Copernic uh, uh, laws of Kepler and uh, of Newton, which are basic principle, and then everything else is deduced for, from, uh, from there. And now, this rigorous uh, uh, deduction was done by uh, Euclid in the, his uh, famous book, uh, The Elements. So Euclid lives in the fourth and the third centuries uh, before our era. So we see here, uh, his, uh, the elements are known to us through translations and uh, copies. Uh, original is, is not preserved. But we see here some copy, one copy in papyrus, another uh, old translation in Arabic, and uh, on the right hand side is a modern edition. It is possible today to buy uh, Euclid's elements or modern translations. Okay, so what was the base of geometry in, in Euclid's uh, elements? So, uh, Euclid understood that in order to, to, jump, to found geomet geometry rigorously, that uh, we cannot uh, really rigorously prove everything, but we need to start from something. And this something are postulates, or axioms, as we call them also. So, so those are, those are uh, the, the statements uh, which uh, we uh, assume that they are true. And then from those statements, we uh, deduce everything else. So here we have uh, those uh, five uh, statements, uh, five postulates, geometry postulates from Euclid. So as you see, they are the first four one are pretty simple, and they are also 
Tyler, I'd say obvious, everybody will agree that this is something that we can assume that it is true. Uh, so we can draw a straight line from any point to any other point. We can extend any finite straight line from any segment. We can continuously uh, extend in both direction uh, indefinitely. We can uh, draw a circle with any center and any angles, and all right angles will be equal to each other. And the final, the fifth, uh, the famous parallel postulate, uh, which uh, said the following. So here we have illustration of this in the in Euclid's formulation is uh, if we have uh, one line intersected by two other lines, and the two other lines form on the inner sides uh, angles whose sum is smaller than, than uh, 180 degrees, then those two lines will intersect exactly in that side of, of the line. So first, uh, we can ask why is that called a parallel postulate when uh, nothing is parallel in that uh, postulate, but let us uh, make the equivalent statement so which it is uh, to see how it is called. So this is the original postulate on the left is, is uh, stated on the previous slide. And this is the equivalent formulation. It said for a line at a point which does not belong to that line, there is uh, exactly one line that contains that point and has no intersection point to the line, or it is a parallel to that line. What does it mean that they are equivalent? Well, that means we have the first four postulates and take this original postulate, the formulation of Euclid, then this equivalent formulation can be proved from all of that as a theorem. Or then we have uh, uh, the opposite one, we take the first four postulates and this equivalent formulation, then the original Euclid postulate can be proved as a, as a, as a theorem. So they are equivalent, they will almost uh, give rise to the same geometry. Everything will be the same in those systems. Okay, that parallel uh, fifth postulate was um, kind of, first it is, uh, as you saw, its formulation is much uh, is, uh, longer and more complicated than the remaining postulate. It's, it is not that simple. It is also not uh, kind of head of you. So we need to draw and to think of this thing to why that to be to perform. Uh, so that um, made people to, to, to think that maybe that parallel postulate, in fact, shouldn't be postulated, but uh, it should be, uh, that it can be proved from the remaining four postulates, that it is, in fact, a theorem in the, in the geometry which is found in all and we can find that the geometry only in the first four postulates. In fact, based on how elements were written, it seems that even Euclid uh, was thinking that, because uh, the first 28 propositions which have been deduced, he used only the first four postulates. He didn't use the parallel postulate. So it, it looks like um, he tried to, to deduce as much as possible without including that, maybe hoping that he, he will deduce uh, the parallel postulate uh, also. So over the next 2,000 years, many, many people, many mathematicians and uh, amateurs tried to prove the parallel postulate Fortunately, many thought that they proved it, but uh, they uh, always had some kind of circular argument in their justification. Uh, so it was uh, 2,000 years full of mistakes and full of belief that this uh, fifth postulate can be proved uh, from, from the first four postulates. So then that question of independence of the fifth postulate was open for, for, for 2,000 years. And then um, let me uh, say a few words about that geometry based on only first four postulates. So let's, uh, uh, we have only first four postulates and we deduce only from that. So those are examples of the uh, statement that we can uh, get in such geometry. This is called the absolute geometry. The first four postulates without the parallel postulate. Those uh, theorems are also in, uh, in the Euclid elements, and uh, maybe slightly differently from it, but they are there. So, uh, one of them is that the sum of the angles of the triangle is not greater than the straight angle. 
and the other one that uh, for a line and the point not belonging to, to that one, there is at least one line which contains that point and is parallel to the original line. At least one. But um, yeah, so those are the, the, the statements, two statements from the actual geometry. So then we come to the final resolving of this uh, question of the of the parallel postulate. Uh, now, based on, on, on those theorems for absolute uh, geometry, we can really assume the ultimate parallel postulate. So that is that for a line at the point which does not be any belong to that line, there are at least two lines that will take the point, uh, the point and they are parallel with the original line. Now, that was uh, a who was who was first to, to publish, to resolve and to publish that, uh, that uh, result. His original idea is it was instead of par parallel postulate, the Euclid's parallel postulate, to, to take this uh, alternate one. And to, uh, with the first four postulates in the alternate one, to try to derive a contradiction, which will uh, again leads to then that to indirect proof that uh, of parallel postulate. So he was working on that diligently and carefully and he didn't got, get a contradiction and finally he understood that, that he will not get a contradiction there that in fact uh, this parallel postulate is uh, independent and that we can assume either Euclid's parallel postulate or that alternate one and we get uh, two different but consistent geometries. So he reported on that in his lecture in February 1926 at the University of Kazan. And uh, he didn't only derive the properties of his geometry. You know, you can always uh, ask about that. Okay, I want to get, he wanted to get a contradiction that he didn't get, but maybe if he dug deeper, maybe he would got that contradiction. But uh, he, in fact, uh, did uh, more than that. He proved the um, that uh, in fact in this what he called imaginary geometry is uh, that the metric formula for triangles in that uh, geometry when they are uh, multiplied by, by the imaginary uh, constant they take the form from the uh, one known formula in the spherical geometry so that means since spherical geometry is geometry of the sphere in the Euclidean space that uh, would mean that uh, in fact this Imaginary geometry or geometry of Lobachevsky is as consistent as the geometry of Euclid. You cannot find a contradiction there if Euclidean geometry is consistent. Uh, and it is worth to mention that there were also uh, parallel work on, on that geometry by uh, Janusz Boyer, but that one was published uh, later. Okay. Let us uh, again uh, see, illustrate here. Uh, the plane of Lobachevsky. So this is the plane with the, where we have the first four postulates, Euclid's postulates, and the uh, alternate, uh, alternate uh, action of parallels, which said that a line, and uh, with a true a point, we would have at least two lines uh, which are uh, parallel to, to a given line. And we think here, it's a nice artwork because it's based in fact on what is called Poincare, this model of the geometry of Lobachevsky. And uh, now we think that the Lobachevsky points will be all points within a given circle. And the lines will be a circular arcs which are orthogonal to that uh, linear circle. So lines are here, this, uh, this uh, uh, white uh, arcs. And you can see here, we have here, for example, this is one line here, this, the, the, and consider this point here, and we see here we can observe several uh, lines, in fact, uh, you see if you have uh, at least two that you will have infinitely many, each one which goes in between them will be also parallel to that one. So we have multiple parallel lines there. In fact, this picture uh, represents the Tiling of, uh, of Lobachevsky plane by those congruent fishes. They are all on, of the same Lobachevsky size, although they appear smaller near the boundary. Uh, but uh, th this is how, how this model uh, works. And now we, we can ask now the following about the general consistency of geometry. 
So, uh, geometries of uh, Euclid and of Jesse can be, in fact, modeled within each other. As we saw on the previous, the current, this model is the model of Lobachevsky plane within the Euclidean plane. And similarly, one can find also a model of Euclidean plane in the, in, within the Lobachevsky geometry. So, they are both consistent or both inconsistent. But we can ask really, are they really consistent? I mean, maybe they are both contradictory. So then our uh, whole geometry all falls down. And uh, let's let's ask uh, this question in the following way. When we have some axiomatic foundation of, of a theory, what do we expect of those axiomatic? What, what do we want from those axioms? So the first, uh, I mean, necessary thing that we need is consistency. So we don't want that our axioms imply any kind of contradiction. Then, then that's not a theory at all. So this is uh, something which is necessary. The second uh, requirement, which would be nice to have, is completeness. Completeness means that you can either prove or disprove any statement which is made within that theory. So that for any statement for that theory, that someone gives, then one can find out if that statement uh, from, it can be deduced from the axiom or it is uh, its contradiction, to, its uh, negation can be deduced from the, from the axiom. And the uh, third requirement is minimality. It is more of a static requirement. So minimality would be that those axioms are mean, the system of axioms is minimal. So that means that you cannot deduce, for example, some of the axioms from the other ones. So this is what, for example, for the geometry of Euclid, that 2,000 years people believe that uh, this uh, system is not minimal because uh, they believe that the fifth postulate can be derived from the first four one, which which uh, the chances show show that that is not true. But uh, so we want that, and we want also it it would be preferable that those axioms are somehow stated simply. And uh, and uh, that is easy to understand uh, the meaning. And, but then we can ask, I mean, how to show any of that in some theory, uh, if the theory is consistent, complete, minimal, or whatever. And uh, also connected to that, when we have a theory, is there an algorithm which can uh, verify statements made within the theory? So algorithm you give statement to algorithm and algorithm somehow do some, I don't know, calculations, whatever, and tells you, oh yeah, this is true, this is a theorem of the theory, or we said, no, this is not true in that theory. So the answers to these questions are given by the incomplete theorem by Kurt Geber. So, was a mathematician, philosopher, or scientist, it is interesting to, to note that uh, he published only nine papers, but each of his papers was from the and by the way, nine papers in different areas, in mathematical logic, in theology, in physics, each of his papers was fundamental for, for the area where, where he published. So, in completeness theorem of the area, it states loosely as follows. So, to formulate them really rigorously, would take me, uh, would take a lot of time. So this is a, a loose formulation. Uh, and this is, it says if an axiomatic system is consistent, then it cannot be complete. Uh, so by axiomatic system, it means an uh, axiomatic system which is sufficiently complex. And uh, I mean, uh, for example, uh, geometry is uh, certainly that. And uh, second, Incomplete theorem is that the consistency of axioms cannot be proved within their system. So it is, and it's also that means that there is no algorithm which will verify their theory in statements uh, in any complex theory. So it, it may seem disappointing, but in fact, it is not disappointing. It is good that uh, Gendel's theorems uh, are there because otherwise mathematics wouldn't be as uh, exciting and, and interesting as it is now. And uh, I would like also to mention about another paper of Gendel, which is not uh, about uh, mathematics, 
of autism of variety of mathematics. There was a long time with the Einstein, and he uh, gifted one of his land papers to Einstein for his uh, 70th birthday. And um, this is uh, the paper where Gedel, in fact, proved that within uh, Einstein theory, uh, one can find the solutions uh, where the universe returns to, to the past. So Einstein was not happy for that uh, gift uh, because he didn't want to have a travel back in time and he even started doubting his own theory. However, let us go in this lecture back to the past. Again, go back to ancient Egypt. And now I would like to conclude in um, this lecture by several art pieces and uh, to, from different uh, again, um, eras and to, to, to compare how a three dimensional space uh, was depicted in those uh, images and, uh, and what the geometry can say to us about uh, that. So the first one, ancient Egypt, Egypt again, is typical for, for ancient art. Uh, everything is flat in the picture. Uh, every, all the figures and objects appear to be in one plane. Uh, here, the size is, uh, in fact, of those human figures that we see there. They don't uh, reflect their position in space. They reflect their social status. So usually their large figure represents some uh, I mean, more important, or socially more influential persons, and uh, so on. So this is, this is one picture. So the next one is a detail from a famous uh, scroll along the river during the Qingming Festival from China. And uh, what, what can you see here in this depiction of the three-dimensional space? So we see here, uh, like, for example, we see this big wall there, and the edges of the walls, they are persistently parallel. So here, the parallel lines are depicted as parallel lines. So uh, we, something which is parallel in the space is parallel also in the, pic also in the picture, and uh, which are more far be behind are somehow stepped in the, the picture. So we see that, uh, that closer to us uh, are on the bottom, the objects on the bottom, while upper are further objects. Okay, so this may be correspond to something which we call upper geometry. So uh, I would also like to mention that here, I want just to observe how three-dimensional space is represented on, the, on different features. But this is not uh, some kind of ranking or telling what is better, because there is no really, indeed, a right or wrong way to, to represent when you want to, to squish three dimensions to the two dimensions. You, do, you move something, something you can preserve. So the way how to do that can be a matter of many things, including tradition or, or whatever. And the um, third picture, is the school of Athens. This is the fresco by Raphael. So first in the lower right corner uh, is uh, Euclid teaching geometry to his students. Uh, what we can see here, we can see a perspective of the parallel lines uh, are depicted in such a way that they would if, if uh, extended so all of those are parallel edges which are extended, uh, if, if they would extend, they would all meet at one point uh, somewhere maybe in the middle of that uh, picture. And this is called perspective. Uh, in fact, the uh, idea of this perspective, of that, parallel, that all lines would eventually intersect, is um, one uh, of the postulates of uh, what is called projective geometry, uh, which is uh, a geometry uh, which, uh, in a certain sense, uh, expands and unifies both uh, Euclidean and uh, geometry of uh, Lobachevsky. And with this, I would like to uh, finish my uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. It was wonderful.
going to see all these pictures and put it on the grid probably not. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes? I just come with the microphone. And please don't ask me to time travel back to 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I'm a teacher, I've been teaching, it's my 34th year now in high school, and I just think it's a great pity that what did they wipe out of the new syllabus? Geometry and phonics, which I think is a horrible thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Hi, uh, great talk, I really enjoyed that. And I was curious about the girls in Katlina's theorem statement you made about the geometry in um, I believe maybe I might have misremembered. There was, I think, the Euclidean theorem applies. You have some sort of natural number system or something. So does that mean geometry gives rise to natural numbers? Yeah, uh, Gettel didn't really uh, formulate this uh, his theory about uh, geometry, but uh, this is a kind of equivalent because you can, uh, I mean, in the modern logical setting of mathematics, you start from sets. And then from sets, you build the natural numbers, then you can build uh, rational real numbers, and, but then when you have real numbers, you also have geometry. But also you can build the uh, numbers within geometry, like for example, taking the uh, one line and points of the lines represent real numbers. So they are, uh, in fact, um, equivalent because they can be built one from each other. Uh, numbers from geometry and uh, geometry from numbers. So, so I mean, uh, Gettel's incomplete theorem uh, also apply to, to geometry as well. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Theories? Yeah, okay. Milena, we have a question about someone who's confused about the ultimate parallel postulate. So, if two lines are distinct, straight, and parallel, how can they contain the same point? Yeah, this is a this is a good question because this is not something uh, we we observe uh, the world of, uh, around us uh, as um, more or less Euclidean. So this is why these Euclidean axioms were first to, to appear. Euclidean considerations were first to, to appear. However, when you have axiomatic foundation of the theorem of the, of the theorem, uh, like uh, points and lines, would be, can be any objects. Which satisfy your your axiom, so they don't need to confirm to our to something of what we imagine really to be a line or a point. So, as for example, in in this uh, particular point, this model, our points, uh, Lobachevsky points, will be points within this uh, this particular circle, and Lobachevsky lines will be circular arcs which are orthogonal to the boundary circle. And they do satisfy all the axioms of uh, first four postulates of Euclid plus this uh, alternate uh, parallel postulate. So, so this is how that we can see that to be true. But we really don't see this around us because uh, the world appeared to us as to be Euclidean. So one other question was in the chat was a question of whether some of the art from these artists whether you think they interacted with mathematicians in forming the artworks. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, for Escher's uh, those uh, there are several uh, works in, in this cycle of circle. They uh, they are certainly were inspired by mathematical results. Uh, so regarding the Ancient, I mean, yeah, probably yes, but I, I cannot really uh, completely answer to that question. But uh, uh, I just would like to know that, that uh, in these times of uh, ancient times or in times of Renaissance, uh, people, those um, artists or, I don't know, philosophers or mathematicians, they were like uh, very multi-skilled and they were experts in, in many areas so so they, they could be as well uh, had a good knowledge of of geometry and and, uh, and applied it to, to their work thank you so please join me thank you again